Well, this is session 24 of 24 sessions on the book of Revelation. And we're going to go from the millennium of the last chapter into eternity. That's mentioned, mentioned in chapter 21, and uh, the whole book is wrapped up in chapter 22. And uh, again, we're in the field of eschatology, which, as you know, splits into two divisions, amillennial, premillennial. We're obviously premillennial. Uh, there are some postmillennials around, but uh, we won't focus on that. And a, a subdivision of amillennial is uh, preterism. But we also have, uh, uh, within the premillennial camp, we are also pre-trib. Um, and people who are willing to uh, allegorize things uh, are on the left side of the diagram. That's most denominations. Denominational churches are generally in that category. Uh, premillennial pre-tribs are the Bible, independent Bible churches, the, what some people call the fundamentalists. And it really derives from hermeneutics. If you take the Bible very literally, very precisely, very seriously, as we would put it, uh, you're on the right side of that chart. If, you're, if you treat it allegorically or, or uh, softly, so to speak, um, uh, you would swing to the left side, probably. Recognize that we're in the minority, but uh, our premise is that we take the Bible with great precision. We think that God means what He says and says what He means. We regard the originals as inerrant, free of errors. And uh, uh, that's the big difference. Now, it may surprise you to discover that the views we hold go back to the very early church. Obviously the writings of Paul, but also the Epistle of Barnabas. Um, uh, also Irenaeus is against heresies. Uh, Hippolytus, in his anti all this you can find in the Antonicene Father documents, which are w readily available. Uh, Hippolytus being a, di a disciple of Irenaeus, by the way. Justin Martyr, uh, also a character by the name of Ephraim of Nisibis, who probably wrote about the third or fourth century. Critics say it was probably the fifth or sixth century. Let's not quibble. It's he clearly his his sermons and so forth are very comfortably uh, be very comfortable to present here. They're pre-trib, uh, premillennial sermons in effect. Um, the other a lot of other premillennials I'll mention just in passing uh, from 1687: uh, uh, Peter Giraud, Philip Doddridge, uh, John Gill. James McKnight, Thomas Scott, all these people wrote commentaries that are premillennial, pre-trib commentaries. And I mention that because there's, there are characters around that try to say it all was invented by uh, Darby and his gang. In the, the, among the Plymouth Brethren, at the, in the early part of the 19th century, by a guy by the name of Lacunza, a guy by the name of uh, Edward Irving in, uh, in 1812, 1816, Margaret MacDonald in 1820, and Jan Darby in 1830 popularized the pre-trib, pre-millennial view. And, uh, in, in, and uh, because they be, did such a conspicuous job of popularizing, many superficial uh, scholars that are misinformed think they invented the view. They just haven't done their homework. Yes, they did popularize it and, and had, had much to do with it becoming widespread in our more recent history. But you'll discover these views are views that were held by a minority, a small remnant of people all through the history of the church. Well, we've been through the book of Revelation through its three major divisions. And uh, obviously the most important division in our view is the chapters 2 and 3. We've come a long way from there, so I don't want you to forget that. If you're going to go back and study the book, focus on chapters 2 and 3. They're the core for you and me on the book. And, uh, but we have been, of course, we're, uh, we're now wrapping up the, the third of the three sections uh, of the, what I call the divine outline. And obviously we've been very conscious of the heptatic structure, and uh, as an appendix to our books and so forth, we often will list literally hundreds of the uh, sevens uh, in the Bible and in the book of Revelation. I don't think you can exhaust them. Uh, we've been conscious of the conspicuous ones, of course, as we've gone through uh, the structure of the book. But we're in the, f we're in the final section, of course. We went through Babylon and all that, the, the second coming of Christ, the millennium, and now we are in the last two chapters of the book. You ever, have any idea why Revelation has 22 chapters? Not 21, which is a multiple of 7. Not 28. Why 22? Anyone have any guesses? How many letters are there in the Hebrew alphabet? 22. So if you notice, the Psalms are often organized around the letters of the alphabet. And this is just another indication that somewhere along the way, someone was conscious of the fact that the thought, that the, the book is in Greek, but the thought patterns are in Hebrew. And uh, so I'll let you run with that, but that, let's just jump in. First verse of Revelation 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And this comes out of Isaiah 65 or 17. This is, you know, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's just, it's, uh, 
It's exactly what we pray in the uh, Lord's Prayer, to do it uh, on earth as it is in heaven, right? And that's what we're beginning to see here. And we're, we're the, the, the first heaven and the first earth are gone. There is no more sea. And uh, the day of the Lord shall come as a thief of the night, Peter tells us. In the second letter, Peter says, the day of the Lord shall come as a thief of the night, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise. Boy, I can imagine. And the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. This is, this is a nuclear physics kind of language in my mind. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? The word conversation here in the Old English means behavior, not conversation. Like, that's one of those terms that's changed its meaning. It's, there's only about ten of these terms. If you learn those terms, King James is not a problem. But that's one of them. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for the new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness, which is what this is all about. This is where we're headed. So in Revelation chapter 21, verse 2, John, I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride for her husband. And uh, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and he be their God. Isn't that what Emmanuel means, God with us? Huh? And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Well, now, wait a minute. I've got a little problem with that. If there is no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow, and so forth, where are the tears coming that God's wiping away them from? Why would there be tears in heaven? The only thing I can think of is lost opportunities. That person that you didn't talk to over the fence. That person that was going away on a trip and was unsaved. That Anyway, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Boy, I'm ready for that one. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. A fresh start, man. Verse 8's got a very strange list, a very instructive catalog here. Notice this. But the fearful, the unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Do you notice who's mentioned first? Fearful. Wow. And the unbelieving. It's fearful here in the sense of lack of awe of God. A lack of, you know, a lack of fear of God is obviously what it's talking about. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials or bowls full of the seven last plagues, and talked to me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Don't get confused with the wife and her habitat. Okay? Many people presume that the wife is the habitat. No, I'm going to show you the wife, and he takes her to where she's living. He carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now the jasper uh, is, is um, the, the, there's a similarity here in, in terms of the Hebrew words for crystal and the Hebrew word for ice. It, 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 many people think that the, what's tra translated jasper is actually a diamond. So it's clear. It's a clear stone, it would seem. But in any case, um, uh, this leads to what we had, what the, the, the New Jerusalem, the Holy Jerusalem, a descending out of heaven. This isn't something built on the earth. In fact, it doesn't even say it comes to the earth. Uh, there are all kinds of hard, uh, artists' renderings of what they think the New Jerusalem is. This is a classic one, but 
uh, doesn't fit anything in my mind. There are others that see it as a geometric shape hovering over the earth. And uh, there are several different renderings of that uh, in the minds of, of some artists. Um, but it, uh, it, it is the source of light. That's where all these miss, miss in a sense. Um, to get into this subject, before we get into this text of this, I want to pause for a minute because I think you and I need to be sensitive to the fact that you and I tend to be myopic. We tend to think of three dimensions. We live in a three-dimensional world. Length, width, height, right? Uh, spaces with more than three are called in math and physics hyperspaces, spaces of more than three dimensions. And uh, there are only two kinds of people that can deal with hyperspaces. Um, that's uh, mathematicians with special training and uh, small children. <laughs> they have no problem with this at all. Now, uh, there are some insights that we can get. It takes training to go up in dimensions. If I start talking four or five, six dimensions, we'd lose everybody because it's, it's not our experience base. But we can gain some insights by going from our three dimensions down to two. Let's try to imagine a two-dimensional world with two-dimensional people and see what inferences we can get. There was a guy that did that, Edwin Abbott, a clergyman about the turn of the, uh, turn of the century. I want to introduce you to Mr. and Mrs. Flat. Okay? Now you need to be very compassionate here because Mr. and Mrs. Flat suffer from a very serious handicap. They have only two dimensions. Okay? So they're flat. <laughs> they have length and width. They have no depth is the idea. I know you've met some people like that. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> So they live in a two-dimensional universe. Two-dimensional people in a two-dimensional universe. Now, uh, if I come up to them, I can put my finger, as a three-dimensional being, I can put my finger one millionth of an inch away from Mr. Flat, and at the same time do the same thing with Mrs. Flat, no matter where she is. I can be more intimate with both of them, independent of what they're doing with each other. You follow me? You see, because I enjoy an additional dimensionality. That's one thing it gives me, okay? Something else, if I was going to put my finger through their two-dimensional universe, what would they see? Well, they would see what it would amount to a circle, wouldn't they? It would start with a point, get to a circle. When I pull it back out, it would shrink and disappear, right? They would only be able to see the two dimensions of my three-dimensional finger. Are you with me? And uh, so... Um, if I put a, a, a finger near Mrs. Flat, she'd see a circle. And if I put two fingers near Mr. Flat, he, she'd see two circles. So she'd go to the circle. She, he, she'd go to the church of the one circle, and he'd go to the church of the two circles, and they'd argue about that. Okay. Now, if a ball fell through their their two-dimensional universe, it would start as a point, open up to a circle, close to a point as it passed through. Right? You got the picture? They would have. They, they could only infer, maybe if they're very, very clever, what the shape of the ball really was. But it would take tremendous insight because they only know two dimensions. Okay. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17, uh, Paul says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes all knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Did you catch that? How many? Four. Four dimensions. Paul just sort of slips that by you, right? One of those four is the Greek word for time. Or it can, could, can be rendered time. So there's four dimensions for what it's worth. Well, uh, how would you communicate a three-dimensional object to a two-dimensional universe? See, uh, uh, one way you could do is by a two-dimensional projection. Let's assume I had a cube, a, a, a three-dimensional cube. I want to communicate that to Mr. and Mrs. Flat. So I've got to get it in the two dimensions. How can I do that? Well, one way would be to do what a, 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 a grassman would say would be a projection, right? That doesn't help much. Um, here's a three-dimensional projection of a four-dimensional hypercube. There's one of these on the internet you can manipulate. And the more you manipulate it, the more you realize you have no idea what's going on. Uh, <laughs> so, the, uh, not very useful. Another way I might communicate a three-dimensional object to two-dimensional people would be to unravel it. So I could take that three-dimensional cube, right, and fold it out like a box. And maybe that would try to help Mr. and Mrs. Flat conceive of what a three-dimensional thing might be. Not very useful, is it? There is a four-dimensional cube unraveled in three dimensions, okay? 
It's, it's, it's an un, it's a, a four-dimensional cube. It's called a Hinton cube. This is an th- unraveled one. It's called a tesseract. Uh, there's only one place in the world I've ever seen it used. And it really surprised me to discover this. And that's Salvador Dali in his painting of the crucifixion of Christ, Corpus Christi. He puts Christ on a four-dimensional cube. And I was astounded when I realized this because I had no idea that Salvador Dali was that sophisticated mathematically to know what a Hinton cube was, but he did, and and the implications of it are are astounding. Uh, Other than that, I don't know of a practical application of it. But anyway, having said all of that, what I'm trying to say is I don't pay a lot of attention to the description of the New Jerusalem because I'm not convinced it's in three dimensions. You follow me? So once you have that um, uh, lack of restriction, let's go through it. Uh, it had a great wall high and had twelve gates, and at the gates were twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which were the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations. Now I'm a little confused. I got now, you know, I got twelve gates, and I've also got twelve foundations, and in the names, and in them the names of the twelve apostles. Well, that's kind of, that's uh, pretty, you know, interesting. Um, the twelve tribes, by the way, suggest the, the encampment around the tabernacle in the book of Numbers. You can get in, you can play games with that one a little bit, if you, in, the, in that kind of a mood. Um, so, the apostles are the foundation, of course, Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. The building of the wall was as of jasper, or like a diamond, clear. In other words, this thing is all, this thing's bathed in light. The city was pure gold like unto clear glass. Now see, that sounds confusing. It's um, clear, it's gold, and yet it's clear. <laughs> well, okay. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. I think precious stones are used in the Bible for light, colored light. Whether it's the breast of the high priest, which has twelve stones, or whether it's the uh, uh, here and other places. Um, Satan was clothed with multicolored precious stones. I think clothed in light. I think Adam and Eve were before the fall and so forth. The first foundation, there's twelve, you're going to have all these foundations here. Foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all matter precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysoprosis, and the eleventh a jacinth, and the twelfth an amethyst. Now, there are books. I've collected uh, people who have tried to analyze these, because everyone's pretty confident that these twelve stones will map some way with the twelve stones on the breastplate of the high priest. The twelve stones of the high priest clearly link with each of the twelve tribes of Israel. Um, Do these. We're not sure. The experts... um, are uh, unable to track these names because the names of semi-precious stones, as we would label them, are uh, changed throughout history. uh, uh, I I have seen several pieces of jewelry in Israel which have the breastplate, and they all research thoroughly the rabbinical studies, but if you look at them, they're they're different. (laughs) You know, you've got two rabbis, you've got three opinions, of course. (laughs) And so, and it gets worse as you go through history. Because by the time you get to Paul, you're not talking in Greek, and the names are not traceable. So, uh, Paul himself is trying to make the transpositions for you. He's making his own translations from the Hebrew to the Greek equivalents in all of this. And this is also alluded to in Isaiah 54. But the breastplate of the high priest is in, I, in Exodus 28 and 31 and 39. You can find it there. But let's move on Revelation 21, verse uh, 21. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. And I remember pearls was a Gentile stone. It was not kosher. It was... It was a very, very, they come from the sea, not from the earth. Uh, uh, they grow in response to a stimuli, and they grow by accretion, and then they're removed from where they grow to be an item of adornment. So the pearl is an incredible idiom of the church that Christ uses in Matthew 13. But here we have 12 gates with 12 pearls, and you'll notice that Peter is not guarding a single one of them, okay? Despite all the stories of Peter at the gate. I don't know where they, anyway, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. There again, the gold and the transparent glass are idiomatically similar in several places here. I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. 
That's consistent with Matthew 12, 6. One greater than the temple is here, it tells us. Indeed. And uh, so, um, and the city had no need for the sun, neither of this moon to shine it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. It wouldn't surprise me at all, since, there, since we have a new heaven and a new earth, that the light on the earth is this city, is illuminating the earth, interestingly enough. So I see this in those terms, but that's just, you know, one person's imagination. We'll have to wait and see. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. The gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, and there shall be no night there. So a very different situation here. And uh, they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations to it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Are you written in the Lamb's book of life? That's the real issue. You want to be sure of that. You should not leave here with any doubt about that in your mind. Let's go to the wrap-up, chapter 22. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, and in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. And they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever." And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. The Lord God of the holy prophets and sent his angels to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Um, the word sure, it, it, it read, implies quickly, uh, quickly done. And behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he. By the way, the, the, uh, the word quickly here is uh, taku. It means in rapid succession, if you will. Um, and. Uh, Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. This book is prophecy. It says so. There are people running around saying, you know, that the book that it's not a book of prophecy. What's well, that's that's calling <laughs> it's calling him a liar. And then another interesting thing, and I John saw these things and heard them, and when I heard them and seen, when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship the feet of the angel which showed me these things understandable response, but that's a no-no, John. Then saith he to me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. Don't worship me, worship God. You always find that the, the diligence of the angel that someone would try to worship. And that's what makes the last few verses of Joshua 5 so significant, because Joshua encounters this man with a sword drawn who commands worship. Take off your shoes, you're on hallowed ground. It's obviously Jesus Christ Himself. It's not some super angel, it's Christ Himself. An angel would not allow Himself to be worshipped. There's only one angel who allowed Himself to be worshipped, and He got in a big, in a lot of trouble. His name was Lucifer. Uh, and He said to me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. That's in contrast to the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, seal up the book until the time of the end. The fact that we're now beginning to discover and understand the book of Daniel is another sign of the end. It's a hard one to use to non-believers, so we usually don't promote that, but it's a very true, very true phenomenon. There are discoveries in the book of Daniel that are recent years. As we look at the text, we realize what it's saying, that it's escaped notice for 1700, 1,900 years. More, in fact. And uh, it was sealed until the time of the end. The fact that it's becoming unsealed tells us we're in the time of the end. It's, and there's aspects there that are conspicuous and astonishing that they weren't recognized before. Here he says, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that be holy, let him be holy still. <laughs> that sounds like strange advice, doesn't it? And uh, what they'll be, they'll be, is really what it's saying. And, be, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. And here he identifies himself. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. You know, I, I mentioned this when he first opened the study. I'll remind you again. You know, you, you get people ringing your doorbell. 
wearing neckties and riding bicycles, you know, and they, uh, they want to tell you that, uh, uh, that Jesus isn't, you know, isn't God. What you want to do is take them to Isaiah 44 and, and 48. There's places where, where it says the first, just do your concordance, where it says, I'm the first and the last. You say, who's that? And the, well, it's Jehovah God. Good. You go to you know, 44, 48, and you go, right, you go through those. Who is that? It's Jehovah, Jehovah God. You come to this one. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Well, that's Jehovah God. When, they, when they've gotten that guard, then you take them to Revelation 1, 8, where I'm the first and the last who was dead and am alive and live forevermore. Who's that? They don't know. They stumble on that one, because that's obviously Jesus Christ. Anyway, blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have the right, to, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. They're outside the city. You know, dogs come back, come off very badly in Scripture. Do you realize that? Um, they were the scavengers of the ancient world, and uh, they were considered unclean. And uh, dogs were also the Hebrew designation for Gentiles. And uh, it was also Paul's label for the Judaizers. But um, anyway, there are seven glories of the redeemed. Um, we need to keep our lives clean because the redeemed have no curse. The throne of God and the Lamb, His seven servants shall serve Him. There's an eternal vision of His face. His name will be in their foreheads. They have eternal day. There's no night there. And they have an eternal reign. And they're detailed here. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Huh? Then you get to verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Bear in mind, you see, the seven churches had a cover letter and then this book attached to it. You follow me? So each of the seven churches got the letter and this package with them. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you testify you these things in the churches. These were to be, the whole thing was taught in all the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. The Spirit and the bride say, come. Where's the bride? With him at this point, right? The Spirit and the bride say, come. Let them that heareth say, come. And let him that is athirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. The redemption of Jesus Christ, the ability to abide with Him in the holy city, is available for the asking. And that's the gospel that we declare today. He continues, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of, this, of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. And boy, it's my earnest prayer that in this study that we've done no more than point you to the text, try to highlight some views about the text for your edification. But if there's anything that we want to underscore and emphasize is to do your own homework, to read the book for yourself. Not just this book, the whole Bible. Because we think the Bible is the commentary on itself. But you know, it really is, I shudder to think what's going to happen to these publishers that publish blasphemous paraphrases. Uh, uh, the guy that did the message. Um, a blasphemous translation. Not a paraphrase. You don't paraphrase God. You may have translational issues. But... Uh, to, to, to muddy up what God said is, and what's really scary, can you imagine what's going to happen to the members of the so-called Jesus Committee, the Jesus Seminar, that would take votes on what Jesus really said? And he didn't really say that, and he didn't really say that, and so forth. Um, that's what Peter, 2 Peter 3.16, they are the unlearned and unstable uh, who uh, rest as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. You don't add or take away. You treat God's word with respect. And uh, he which testify these things saith, surely I come quickly, amen, even so come Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, amen. And so ends the book. But I want to close on a little, a little bit more here on some thoughts. What, you know, we talk about the gospel. 
And what's really part of what we're dealing with here is not only is the book of Revelation not taught in churches, the gospel's not taught in churches. You can go to a lot of churches and never hear what the gospel. We use that term very loosely. What do we mean by the gospel? Paul defines it for you in 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Can you believe in vain? Wow, that's a, that's a scary thought. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that? Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel. Three elements. He didn't just die. He died according to uh, hundreds of specifications. He died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Then He was buried. Only Paul emphasized that because he builds a case on baptism as a result of that. And that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the Gospel. And, uh, and he goes on to emphasize that He was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve, and that He was seen above, uh, of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present day. But some are fallen asleep. The people, the church He's writing to, had in their congregation people that were part of that five hundred. You follow me? The analogy is often used is, suppose I tried to tell sell you the idea that John F. Kennedy was killed with a bow and arrow in Dealey Plaza back in 1963. Well, you'd laugh at me, sure, because you know that's not true. I could never sell it to you because there are people here that saw it happen. Okay. Well, that's the same thing here. There were people in the Corinthian congregation that were among that 500. That's why you can use this as a frame of reference. And he goes on, for after that he was seen of James and all of the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the firstfruits of them that slept. And since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, and afterward they that are Christ, that is coming. And then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, and he shall put, have put down all rule and all authority and power, and he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. In the twinkling of an eye. That's not the blink of an eye. It's the twinkling of an eye. How, how, what's the length of time it takes light going at 300,000 meters per second to go through the th thinness of your reflected on your retina. It's about 10 to the minus 43 seconds. It's a, it's a, quank, it's a quank time. It's a, it's a what's called a Planck time. Anyway, at the, at the last trump. That's not a trumpet judgment. Don't get confused by that. It's a trumpet of God shall sound. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. And for this incorruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? It may shock you to know that he's quoting Greek poets there. <laughs> but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's his plan of redemption. The first act of religion is recorded in Genesis 3. When Adam and Eve sinned, the, when the eyes of them were open and they knew that they were naked, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. That is, co not apron, covering or armor. Because they recognized, see, I believe they're clothed with light until they, they fell. They knew that they were naked. They, they, cover, they tried to cover themselves. And God's plan of redemption shows up there in verse 21. And Adam also and his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them? We missed the point of that little one sentence until we, we grab the rest of the Torah on, into our understanding. What God is teaching them is about the shedding of innocent blood, they would be covered. And, uh, and that would be on another tree in another garden, a place called Gethsemane. There's a scarlet thread. God announces His plan of redemption to Adam from the sea of the woman, then calls Abraham then calls it tribe of Judah, then the dynasty of David. And as God focuses His, uh, 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 as He 
incrementally reveals his plan of redemption, it allows Satan to focus his attack. So Abram singled out, then the tribe of Judah singled out, then, Dan, then David and his descendants are singled out, then the virgin birth. That all continues to another tree, in another garden, where he died for you and me. He was crucified on a cross of wood, yet he made the hill on which it stood. And we could talk about the, uh, the attributes of God. Uh, we can understand infinite power. If you know anything about astronomy, you get a, get a feeling for that. Omniscience, we can sort of imagine infinite knowledge. The creation of God manifests both of these so that everyone is without excuse. But what about infinite love? God knowing that man, if left to choose, would enter into a predicament that only the death of God would suffice to extricate him. And that's exactly, greater love hath no man than he that lays his life down for his friends. That's exactly what he did for you and me. Neither is there salvation any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's one of the things, it's very uncomfortable for many, but we need to realize that that is the one, pa one path. Jesus warned us there's two gates. If broad is a gate and it's crowded, you got the wrong gate. Narrow is the gate and straight is the way that leads to, to, leads to salvation. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. It's not going to happen, you already have it. He that believeth on the Son hath already everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now, what's the base of your faith? Well, I'm as good as the next guy. If that's your view, that's called strike one. I'm doing the best I can. Strike two. I'm going to live by the Ten Commandments and Sermon out. Oh, boy. Strike three. No way. You won't be able, you'll discover the reason they're given is to demonstrate that you can't do it on your own power. No, that's the point. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed on how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build on this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, stubble, those are two different foundations, every man's work shall be made manifest, the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man at work of what sort it is. Obviously, the gold, silver, precious stones will survive, the wood, hay, stubble does not. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Very key verse here. You may have all your works destroyed, but if you're saved, or you're saved or not saved by your relationship with Jesus Christ, not by your works. This is one of the key verses about this, to understand that. It's worth building on the right foundation with your works so that you'll end up getting rewards. But even if you lose everything because you've built on the wrong foundation, you know, you've, you've put your works on the wrong, wrong foundation, if you're saved, you're still saved. Yet, it just, it, you're saved like a refugee where everything else is lost. You've, all, you've had me, you've seen me many times make my little line of going from left to right. We're in the past is behind us, we're in the present. <clears throat> the past is a memory, the future is a hope. What is your connection with eternity? Most of us think of eternity as sort of way off in the future. That's, not, that's incorrect. The future is a hope, the past is a memory. Your connection with eternity is right now. It's orthogonal to right now. And uh, the uh, <laughs> yeah, the past is a memory, the future is a hope, and uh, right now is a gift. That's why they call it the present. Right? <laughs> okay. Why not? Your eternity is only a heartbeat away. We can argue about when the rapture is going to occur, what's coming next year, next month. For you, it could be a car crash, a stray bullet, an unexpected stroke. You have an appointment and you are going to die on time, on God's time. And you're, you need to settle this now before you leave the room. There are no accidents in God's kingdom. And the question is, where will you find yourself? And how sure are you? Those are issues that are uncomfortable for many, but need to be joined head-on. It's the most important decision of your life. And what is the basis of your conviction? You need to be really so solidly grounded in that. Remember, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, 
but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? Oh, what a sobering verse follows. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Boy, boy, boy. Well, I want to close. We talked about a lot of dark things here in this study, especially the last couple of chapters. I'd like to close uh, with just sort of a summary. I'm indebted to a pastor by the name of Lockridge in San Diego that passed away a few years ago, but he did something that stimulated me to take this approach. I, I borrowed heavily from him, done it my own way in some respects. But I'll talk to you about our coming king. And I want to remind us that he's king of the Jews. I just got back from a conference. Uh, in fact, much of the discussion, the geopolitical discussion in Washington, really misses the point that Jesus Christ is, the, is a racial king. He's king of the Jews. We forget that. We have a Jewish Messiah. We, it, we, we deal with a Jewish Bible uh, from a, a church that was founded by Jewish leadership. We need to know that. We need to understand that. He's also a national king. Jesus Christ is destined to be king of Israel. He's going to rule the world through Israel. And uh, he's the king of all the ages. He's the king of heaven, the king of glory, and the king of kings, and the Lord of lords. And the question tonight is, do you know him? Do you really know him? He was a prophet before Moses, a priest after Melchizedek. He's a champion like Joshua. He's an offering in the place of Isaac. He's a king from the line of David, a wise counselor above Solomon. He's, he was beloved, rejected, and an exalted son like Joseph, yet far more. The heavens declare His glory. The ferment shows His handiwork. He who is, who was, and always will be. The first and the last. The Alpha and the Omega. The Aleph and the Tau in the Hebrew. The A and the Z in our alphabet. He's the first fruits of them that slept. He's the Ego I Me. The Ichyach Asher Ichyach. The I Am that I Am. He's the voice of the burning bush. He's the captain of the Lord's host the conqueror of Jericho. He's enduringly strong, entirely sincere, eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful, imperially powerful, impartially merciful. In Him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the very God of very God. He's our kinsman redeemer, but He's also our avenger of blood, and He's also our city of refuge. He's a performing high priest, our personal prophet, our reigning king. He's the loftiest at in literature, He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of theology. <laughs> He's the supreme problem in higher criticism. He's the miracle of all the ages and the superlative of everything good. You and I are the beneficiaries of a love letter that was written in blood on a wooden cross erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. They say He was crucified on a cross of wood, yet He made the hill on which it stood. By Him were all things made that were made. Without Him was not anything made that was made. And by Him were all things held together. What held him to that cross? It wasn't the nails. At any time he could have said, enough already, I'm out of here. It was his love for you and me that held him to that cross. He was born of a woman so that you and I could be born again, could be born of God. He humbled himself so that we could be lifted up. He became a servant so that we could become joint heirs with him. He suffered rejection so that we could become his friends. He denied Himself so that, he, so that we could freely receive all things. He gave Himself so that He could bless us in every way. He's available to the tempted and tried. He blesses the young. He cleanses the lepers. He defends the feeble. He delivers the captives. He discharges the debtors. He forgives the sinners. He franchises the meek. He guards the besieged. He heals the sick. He provides strength to the weak. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. He serves the unfortunate. He sympathizes and He saves. His offices are manifold. His reign is righteous. His promises are sure. His goodness is limitless. His light is matchless. His grace is sufficient. His love never changes. His mercy is everlasting. And His word is enough. His yoke is easy and His burden is light. I wish I could describe Him to you. <laughs> he's, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's irresistible. Of course, He's invincible. The heaven of heavens cannot contain Him, and man cannot explain Him. The Pharisees couldn't stand Him, but soon learned they couldn't stop Him. Pilate, the personal representative of the ruler of the world, couldn't find fault with Him. The witnesses couldn't agree against Him. Herod couldn't kill Him. Death couldn't handle Him. The grave couldn't hold Him. He has always been, and always will be. He had no predecessor, and He'll have no successor. You can't impeach Him, and He ain't going to resign. 
His name is above every name. That at the name of Yeshua, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. His is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, that ends our study of the book of Revelation. Where do you go from here? Many people ask me. Well, I assume that you've already been through our product called Learn the Bible in 24 Hours. That's a great place to start anyway. But from there, or this, you can go to the book of Genesis. It's a great place to start. You go through Genesis and the whole Bible to Revelation, it makes sense to go right back to Genesis again, because everything in Genesis that's begun there is consummated in the book of Revelation. And having experienced the consummation summary of the book of Revelation, Genesis is a great place to jump in. But take any book that the Holy Spirit leads you. Go through it verse by verse, preferably in a small study group if you can. And uh, it's, it's a treasure hunt that the Holy Spirit will supervise for you. If you go at it prayerfully, willingly, never get into the Word without opening it with prayer. But be ready to enter the greatest treasure hunt of your life and never lose sight of what it's all revealing. It's all revealing the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. Then.